You guys are going to love Bob. He is extremely knowledgeable, but he's also extremely engaging. And he cares about not just the theories of parenting, but the practicalities of helping us to be able to raise our kids in a way that is a blessing to them, but also that helps us keep our sanity. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Bob Sorensen. Good morning. When I think about the topic that we're exploring today, a simple guide to raising successful kids, I think we'd better play with that topic just a little because I will present a nice, clear, simple guide. Putting it into action in our lives may be a little less than simple. The ideas, however, are going to be incredibly clear and simple to you all. We'll play with them. What do you think? Questions, interaction during the course of the day? What's your guess? Good or no, not so good? Incredibly welcome. Love questions, love thoughts, love to interact. Is it okay if I tell a few stories to illustrate teaching points? help kind of bring it home, make it real. Is it all right if every once in a while I tell a story that might be a little bit funny or a little bit humorous? Would that be okay every once in a while? So let's play with that idea a little bit. I would like, I'm the founder of the Early Learning Foundation. I do a lot of work with the Love and Logic uh, Institute, but my own foundation is called the Early Learning Foundation, and you kind of gather from that that I have some strong notions about why and how, why it's so important to help every kid get a good start in the early years of life. And generally the early childhood years are considered all the way through about age eight or nine. And also how we can help that happen for a whole lot more kids than are in fact happening this, this way, the way we would like to in these early years. For me, this comes from a whole bunch of things. I started out as a high school special education teacher in terms of my profession, did that for about 12 years. And one of my experiences as a high school special education teacher was seeing a whole lot of young men and women come up to me at the high school level who were pretty damaged in some respect, academically or in terms of social emotional skills. Kids that would come up to me as a ninth grader with second grade reading skills, third grade reading skills, first grade math skills, a variety of behavior patterns that were pretty darn challenging and that were getting in the way of their life. And one of the things I wondered from time to time, some kids had obvious neurological handicaps. That was just their, their thing to have to deal with in life and we were able to give really good service to those. But some kids had a whole lot of potential that had somehow been missed, not tapped, not developed in the way that it could be. And from time to time, I looked at those kids and thought, how could we have prevented some of the hurt and some of the difficulty they had experienced along the way? Eventually, I became an administrator, decided to try to do some things at a larger level, influencing more people and served in local and county administrative jobs, central office jobs. And one of the things I was fortunate to be able to do is to develop an early learning initiative in my last district that was incredibly effective and reduced the need for kids to ever go into special education from about 15% state average to about 5% in our district by doing things really carefully both behaviorally and academically, from a social emotional, and even from a sensory motor perspective in the early years of school. And now I know over time that the earlier we get started on these things, the better. We can always do interventions that will make a difference in the lives of people, but after a certain point, it's just a whole lot more work. If we could create those patterns in the early years, we should try to do so. We also know that self-concept is a part of this early learning thing. If I decide by first, second, third grade that I'm a good reader, that sticks with me. However, if I decide by first, second, third grade that I hate math, don't like to do math, not good at math, never liked math, my family's not good at math, we all avoid math, if you make that decision, it may not in fact reflect your potential at all, but it stays with you and it impacts everything that you do academically for the rest of your life. We also know that the patterns of behavior that are established in the early years tend to linger. And so, if I become one of those defiant kids early on, that pattern of defiance is changeable as kids get older, but it's a lot of hard work. It would be easier for you 
and for our kids if we establish those patterns of responsibility, thinking ahead, problem solving, empathy, respect for other people, noticing other people's well-being, some basic social skills. As we do these things early, we make their lives a little easier, and we certainly make our own lives a little easier. And then the other part that I just want to come back to is this learning thing. I have a son who's 25, works out in San Francisco as a small technology company. The kids, the young men, the young women in that entrepreneurial technology world are the most dedicated learners I have ever seen in this in this universe, they love to learn because they know that in their world they have to be a little quicker, a little better, have a skill that other people don't have to be able to find a way to help their company succeed. They are dedicated to learning for life. How could we help way more of our kids do that? But when I'm thinking about this early learning stuff, I think about not just theory, I think about kids. I've known a lot of kids over the years, and one of the stories that I'm thinking about right now is a young guy by the name of Matthew. He's not my Matthew, he was somebody else's Matthew. In math, skills are really low. He's got language problems, sensory motor problems, reading difficulties, math delays. And he is starting to think of himself as a kid who is not a good learner, doesn't like to read, doesn't like to do math, doesn't like to do school. He has loving parents, he has a loving family. But right now I'm looking at this boy and I'm saying to myself, uh-oh, this pattern does not bode well. There's a whole lot of work to be done. And yet there's something about this kid that tells me that there is potential that has yet been untapped. There's something sweet and there's something nice and there's something able about him. It just hasn't been able to be brought through. But he is on the verge of quitting. In fact, he's already one of those kids that has learned to be passive. He doesn't really act to make the world a place where he can be successful because when he's tried, he has failed, and so he has started to step away. I worry about kids like this. This can't go on long before it's permanent. And yet in his situation, he doesn't live and go to school in a place where I have a whole lot of control, so I don't have teachers who can follow through, and I don't have systems in place, and I don't have people trained to do some of that kind of work. The only thing that this kid has is this loving family with all these siblings and his mom and his dad that showed up for him, and I'm writing out all the different things we need to work on, and there's way too many things to work on, and that's okay. I'll pick a couple of things that are the priorities for him, but how could I possibly expect all the work that needs to be done here to take place, I said to myself. And then I made a horrible judgment. I said, this poor kid is out of luck. I don't think I can find a way to make sure that he gets what he needs. He's probably never going to. Boy, everyone's, I must have been feeling discouraged that day. But I like it so much when I sometimes <laughs> find that I have been wrong in my estimates. Because something special happened here that taught me a lesson that I will never, ever forget. Mom and Dad came back in. I went over a short plan. I wrote it out for them. I made sure that we put it in great detail. They took this plan home, and as they walked out the door that day, I said, wow, I don't have a support system in place for these people. I don't know how they'll ever be able to follow through. This one's probably not going to work. But I was wrong. They went home, it was the end of his first grade year, they went home and established a schedule based on the plan and the information that I had given them. And every single person in that family was a part of that schedule. Mom did her part, Dad, when he got home, he did his part. Big brother, medium brother, big sister, medium sister, they all had their part with Matthew. And by the end of the summer, he had made some significant gains. His balance was a little bit better. His bilateral motor skills were just beginning to come along, but they still weren't that strong. Oral language and listening skills had been significantly improved. A little bit better in terms of comfort with reading, a little bit better in terms of basic math skills. We had a long way to go. 
It was Thanksgiving before someone called me from the school where Matt attended. It was Thanksgiving and they called me up and they said, we're following that plan that the parents gave us. Matt can finally skip. It took all of Thanksgiving of his second grade year before they got him to the point where he could skip. Why do we care? Because those bilateral motor skills, the ability to get the two sides of the body working together, are incredibly indicative of whether the two sides of the cortex are able to work together for other things, including things like near point vision, being able to comfortably use your eyes close up. That bilateral motor integration has to be developed to a certain point before that near point vision is likely to be comfortable. And when the teacher called me up and told me that, I was so excited, I said, please put this on your calendar. Call me in about two weeks. I want to know what's happening. She did. Two weeks later, she called me up and she said, with tears in her voice, I could hear them. She said, two weeks ago, Matt had about 40 sight words. Today, he has 120. Something is starting to click. The amazing thing to me was the way the family continued to follow through. They worked the plan all summer. I saw Matt again early in the fall. They changed the plan a little bit. They worked the plan. The school got on board a little bit. <laughs> By the end of his first grade, or the end of his second grade year, he had almost caught up in reading. He was skipping, he was integrating, he had developed good sight word vocabulary, math was starting to make sense to him. He came back again a couple of times for a re-eval, things were going better. By the end of his third grade year, he was the best writer in his class, and I completely lost track of Matt. You know how it is? When you do certain kinds of things, you deal with problems. And when the problems go away, you don't know what's going on anymore. And this was one of those situations. By the end of third grade, I lost track of Matt. Matt's dad was a dentist, is a dentist. Matt's mom was a well-educated mom, but she stayed home and took care of her kids. That was her primary job. They were great parents. This was a nice family. Life went on. I didn't know what was happening with them. And then something cool happened. In seventh grade, one of my daughters, Alicia Rose, happened to be in the same grade level as Matt. And we went to one of those junior high, middle school honors nights at the end of the school year. And we knew that Alicia was going to go because she had gotten all A's for one of the quarters that year. That was kind of nice. I was happy to go, sit in those audiences, you, you drink that horrible fruit punch that they serve at those things, you have those nasty cookies, you know, have you all been to these kinds of things? So we went to the honors event, and sure enough, they called all the kids that uh, had gotten all A's in one of the quarters, and almost all the kids that had been invited there were there for that reason. After Alicia, right behind her in the line was Matt. And I hadn't known how successful he had become. He was now a good student. Alicia went through the line for having gotten all A's for one quarter. Then after that, they had the kids line up who had gotten all A's in two quarters. Alicia sat down. She was no longer in the line. <laughs> but Matt was still in the line. And then they had a line for the kids who had gotten all A's in every quarter that year. And Matt was only uh, among only about 10 or 15 kids that were in that line. I was so happy. I was really happy for him. And even kind of happy that he was doing better than Alicia. Because he had overcome some things that make this kind of special.